now to the brand new, a piece by the contemporary composer Michael Finnessy, which has been specially commissioned for this year's Promenade concert. Although Michael Finnessy has a long catalogue of works to his credit, he's never been part of the so-called musical establishment. His music never conforms to any one particular style or category. Followers of new music will know of Finnessy's work, of course, but the last four months have been particularly important for him in bringing his work to a rather wider audience. In May, his opera, The Undivine Comedy, was performed for the first time in Paris and then came to the Almeida Festival in London. And now, tonight marks another first performance. It's a piece called Red Earth, inspired by a trip he made to Australia recently. A few days ago we met and I asked him to tell me more about the piece and how he came to write it. Feelings about Australia and having been there for some months and made friends, um, done some study of Aboriginal art, I was sorry to leave that behind and come back home here. And when I was flying across the central lands of Australia, suddenly the landscape focused all those feelings and impressions I've been having into the germ of a, of a piece. And it's very strange the way a piece of music starts in one's mind. You're never really sure uh, what impressions, what emotions, what, I suppose, in some sense, structural ideas even begin at that moment of coalescence. And when one calls a piece Red Earth and it's ostensibly about just a landscape, I think it, it could be confusing to people that they're expecting to hear something which in some ways sounds like that landscape looks. Um, for me, there are a lot of other things involved in it, Feel, uh, feelings, emotions, which in some ways contradict that, uh, that landscape. I personally, listening to it, found it rather a menacing piece. I felt that I didn't want to listen to it alone on a dark night. Was that <laughs> the sort of reaction you'd expect, or is that wrong? Oh, in some ways, I suppose it is menacing, because certainly one impression I had from the landscape of Australia, not just flying over it, but actually being in it, um, I was travelling around in the job I had in Australia and travelled from Melbourne to Echuca, which is in the north of Victoria. And to get there, you have to cross these the, the bush, really. Um, and it's an, just such an enormous, spacious landscape. And I imagined being in the desert lands alone and just the feeling then is, well, I suppose terror in a way. And I wanted to create an impression of the spaciousness of that landscape in, in the music with sound somehow. So I suppose it is, it is frightening. It's also in a way very sorrowful um, for the same reason that I think man would be completely helpless in that kind of environment. Yes, it does seem to stretch for a long time and then there are some crashes which made me jump the first time I listened to it and then it ends very abruptly. What are you saying there? The intrusions on the landscape are some, well, <clears throat> sometimes I think a, a kind of artistic necessity that if one is making very long space like that, if you're not varying the sound within it, which I chose deliberately not to do um, in order to create that impression of space, suddenly I felt that it was necessary to have something cut through it. Um, and I could relate it to sort of natural phenomenon, if you like, like sudden flashes of lightning in a sky or sudden fissures in a, in a rock surface, which certainly you see in that kind of landscape. It's difficult to say whether those things, again, come from one's observation of natural phenomena or whether they are um, something which you feel is a structural necessity, something to do with the balance of things which have to do with pu purely musical criteria. Mm. The composition of a piece of music which is, I suppose, in some ways abstract, in some ways cuts right below the emotions, in some ways is purely emotional and about feelings. It's a very complex thing to actually talk about and just measuring one's impressions against something which is a very, very abstract, almost mathematical discipline. And I think the, the big crashes of sound, I would prefer to leave to an audience to imagine what they can from that. If it makes them jump, then fine, it makes them jump. 
Red earth is used by the Aborigines, isn't it, in some of their ceremonies and rituals? Yes, it's one of the natural dyes that they use yeah, um, in body painting and for producing bark paintings. Well, they just dry, uh, well, allow the earth to dry and mix it with spittle or something like that and, and paint themselves with it. It has a ceremonial function. You've included two didgeridoos in the piece, sitting where the clarinets usually sit. Did you include those just because they were Australian? I like the sound very much, but I didn't want to isolate the didgeridoo to make a particular point about it being didgeridoos in the orchestra. They're not treated in a soloistic way and other instruments in the orchestra, the trombones most notably, and the bassoons in other sections, which are pretty much the same kind of register of sound, quite deep, um, have a drone, that's to say a static sound, which underpins a whole section of music, uh, so that all the other sounds can be related to it, gravitate towards it. And the two didgeridoos come in three or four sections of the piece and just really hum in the background like a, a a baseline of something. Is it difficult to write for didgeridoos or is it difficult to notate it? Well I had to decide how to notate for them because uh, traditionally speaking it's, n it's not notated, they're not notated. But as the didgeridoo is just a, um, a tree trunk which is hollowed out, it produces a fundamental tone which you can notate at any pitch depending on what kind of didgeridoo you have, though each of them only has one sound. And then overtones of that which is the same as blowing down any tube. Um, it produces harmonics, first, second, third, fourth harmonic. Um, I didn't write harmonics for the didgeridoos, they just blow the fundamental sound. And also, you can change the color of what they're um, playing by blowing a particular vowel sound down the tube, A, E, I, O, U, and it changes the color of the fundamental sound. That happens only in the last section. Did you find yourself very taken by the Aboriginal culture when you were in Australia? Yes, I did. It, um, it was something I was interested in doing before I, I went there. I went with the express purpose of actually making that a part of my visit in any case. Um, it's very hard to have contact with it because most of the Aborigines that you can study, as it were, in an anthropological way are in the north of Australia, in Queensland, and I didn't get up to Queensland. I was fortunate in meeting um, some that happened to be in Victoria doing it was a, a band of children and one man who was leading them, teaching, teaching them the didgeridoo and some tribal dances, um, really for entertainment, which rather disgusted me. Um, but he was very nice and he explained how the, how the music is in actual fact made, uh, which is to say that when they play the didgeridoo for tribal ceremonies, they have a, 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 a set of circumscribed um, impulses that they make with the diaphragm, each one of which is symbolic of a bird or animal call. And each tribe has a totem animal, and so it has its own particular little sound. Um, that would be how the traditional uh, didgeridoo music would be constructed. And of course then they play it for corroborees, which are the tellings of tribal rites and stories and so on and so forth. It's a very, very complex culture, a very sophisticated kind of culture, and there wasn't time to, to study it in any great depth. I met people who had, from whom I'd leaned a lot of background, and I bought a number of books about it while I, while I was there. It's a fascinating, fascinating culture, and uh, it's such an incredible pity that it's, it's disappearing. In the piece, Red Earth, are you trying to say anything at all about the Aborigines? Yes, that, that it's an incredible pity that it's well, they've just been pushed aside. And I think it's impossible to look at Australia and not at least have some pang uh, that that has happened. And certainly that is a part of the piece, yeah.